All right. Good morning. All right. It's good to see you all here. So what I will be uh, talking about today is, uh, you know, how do you go about architecting AI uh, in the enterprise, APIs and applications. So this is a timely topic because most of us are trying to, you know, build AI applications these days. This could be a feature or a product, or you may be trying to, you know, improve your internal operations. So let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Malit Jaisinghe. I'm the VP of Research and AI at WSO2. I have been with the company for uh, eight years. So as Srinath pointed out, I lead all the AI effort. I work closely with uh, product teams and also help to craft the AI strategy. So in addition to my role in uh, AI, I also re lead the research efforts in WSO2. We, close, we work closely with the universities, academics and students, and we you know, try to publish our work in reputed journals and articles, uh, uh, conference and journals. And I travel to uh, you know, uh, conferences, both developer conferences and research conferences to uh, present this work. Right. And I'm so excited to be here today to talk about this, you know, uh, topic. So let's get started with some stats. So what is happening in the global enterprise AI market? So this market is valued at 136 billion in 2022. So this is coming from Forbes, right? And we are expecting an exponential growth. So the expected growth rate is over 36% over the next six years. Of course, you know, generative AI is contributing to this, and that's why I'm focusing more on the Gen AI side. Now, one interesting finding is that by 2026, 80% of the, the organizations have, you know, used a Gen AI API or a model or uh, have deployed a Gen AI application in production, right? Now, another interesting finding is that, so although a lot of us are actually experimenting with uh, this stuff, the number of applications that is entering the production is still quite low. So this is actually, you know, less than 5%. Uh, that was in 2023. So clearly there are a lot of challenges, right? When you try to take your, you know, experimental AI application into production. And this is what we will be uh, focusing on today. So Srinath spoke about this in detail. So I've got only one slide here. So before you start your AI journey, whether you are a product manager or an architect or a developer, you need to understand what is the value that you are going to create, right? If you don't have an understanding of that, you know, you should not continue. So you may be doing this for various different reasons, right? You might want to improve the efficiency, you might want to transform the user experience, you might want to you may be doing it to get the competitive advantage, right? So, so as a developer or an architect trying to build this Gen AI application, there are various questions that you will face on the way, right? So what are these, these questions, right? So Srinath talked about models. What is the model, right? So this is different from the traditional path where you start with the data set. So in this case, you have a base or pre-trained model. You have to start somewhere. So once you have the model, then you ask the question, do you need to fine-tune this, right? Is the fine-tuning required? And what is the data? Srinath spoke about data, right? What is the data that you have? Also APIs. Now, APIs are very important because AI can interact with APIs to create new experiences. I'll talk about that in detail later. 
uh, and then prompt engineering. So you have very basic prompting techniques to very complex, uh, you know, uh, advanced prompting techniques that you can use to do complex tasks, right? Accuracy, right? What is the accuracy and what is the metric? Sometimes the metric is not clear. I mean, in traditional AI, you have metrics, right? But in Gen AI, you may be able to use metrics such as blue score and so on, but yeah. Uh, and what is the speed? Because in most of these applications, the model becomes the bottleneck, right? So if it is slow, then it has an impact on the user experience. So how do you deal with that? And the risks. So Srinath talked about risks also. So let's now go ahead and discuss some of these interesting, some of these important areas. Now before we get into that, there's one thing that I want to point out, and that is the importance of UI and UX, right? Uh, now, you can't wait till the last minute to think about this. So you need to start early, do your designs, and then get the feedback and iteratively improve, right? Of course, this is, does not apply just for Gen AI, it applies to any, uh, you know, application. So sometimes what you can also do is actually build a prototype. So although you don't have your backend services ready, data ready, you can have mock backends, uh, mock APIs, and build a prototype, and then you know, show it to the people, and then get their feedback, right? So for WSO2Con, we have released uh, several features. Uh, how many? Uh, seven features. For Corio, we have released Corio Copilot, which is a very powerful feature. All of these are in preview, by the way. So Corio Copilot lets you talk to Corio in a natural language. You can ask questions. You can learn, learn about Corio concepts, how to do things. It will let you test your APIs. And also, we have integrated the runtime uh, uh, stuff to some level. So you can ask questions about you know, what is the, the latency, what is the latency breakdown for an API, and so on. Then Microintegrator has a VS Code plugin. So there we have MI Copilot, Microintegrator Copilot, which lets you build integrations in natural language. Right? You describe what your integration, you know, what the integration that you want to build, and it, it goes and does it for you. For Asgardio, we have two features. One is this branding feature, which lets you design your logging pages, right? You have to point it to a website, and then it extract you know, the colors and color themes and all that. Then it will design these login pages for you. And Asgardio also has another feature, uh, login flow. Uh, so that lets you, yeah, you know, uh, uh, design the login flows in natural language. And uh, API on-prem product, we have API chat. So this relates to that, you know, AI, API interaction, which I'll talk in details. You can test APIs in natural language. And also there is this other feature, which is the AI-powered API marketplace. You can query the API marketplace and ask uh, questions. Then for Ballerina, uh, we have Ballerina VS Code plugin. There we have introduced this powerful data mapping capability, which allows you to you know, map complex data types by just by clicking a button. OK. So a little bit about the models. So there's a lot of models out there. So when you go about selecting the models, what are the things that you need to look at, right? Yes, there are many factors. Uh, so the accuracy, the cost, the speed, risks. So should not talk about this in detail. And there are certain other things like, are you going to access the model via an API, or are you going to host your model on your own, right? Also, the availability of these models in certain regions also, I mean, sometimes that matters. Clearly, there are 
trade-offs. So highly accurate models can be very expensive, right? Also, they can also be slow. So it boils down to your use case, right? So you have to sort of you know, narrow it down and experiment it and then you know, evaluate the accuracy, evaluate the risks, what is the speed, and then you can you know, decide what your model, suitable model for you. Uh, now the other thing that I want to point out is a given feature does not need to use the same model. So for example, in Corio Copilot, we use multiple models depending on the area that it is dealing with. Right. So once you have the model, of course, sometimes you will directly connect to the model or do an API call. That's it. Done. But usually, general models, uh, you know, for certain use cases, maybe for majority use cases, this is not good enough. So then people go and try to build these rags. So rag is, of course, retrieval augmented generation. It's a very common pattern that is occurring. So what happens in RAG is you put your data into a, some sort of a storage. You call the vector database, and then you basically add more content to the prompt. So you give additional information, and by doing it, you get better accuracy. Right? Then you have these other things that you can do, such as fine tuning. Fine tuning, what it does is it will uh, you know, train the model for a very specific task, right? And if nothing works, then you can pre-train a model that is training from scratch. But for these sort of models, this is actually a very expensive exercise, and it requires a lot of data, right? So, so there are certain things that you can do to models. So in order to do that, you have to have the data, right? So this data can be of different types, right? So it can be your product documentation, internal R&D stuff, and so on. But the thing is, you can't use this data as it is. So you'll have to clean the data. That is the first thing that you would do. That would involve removing things such as PIIs. Because if they get leaked, then you can have data leakages. You know, you can have serious issues, right? Uh, and then the other step is the pre-processing. You can't. In usually, you can't use the data. You have to you know, transform it to a format that you can actually train the model uh, or fine tune the model. Right? Also, there, is, there are cases that you may have. You don't have the data that you have. So in that case, you'll have to build those pipelines so that you can collect this data and then start building the models. Right. APIs. Right. So the APIs, of course, they have different representations. So you have REST APIs. They will have open API schema. Right. GraphQL have GraphQL schema, uh, and so on. Uh, so now AI can interact with these APIs. So having APIs that are well documented is very important. Right. Prompt engineering. This is a relatively new area, and there's a lot going on, right? There's academics working on this, and also the industry is working on this. There's a lot of papers being published also. So the prompt engineering is basically guiding generative AI to produce desired outputs, right? The prompt is the natural language instruction describing how generative AI should perform a task. So there are simple sort of prompting techniques. You may have already heard these things, like zero-shot prompting, few-shot. Few-shot, for example, you give few examples. You know, with your natural language query, you add few samples. By doing it, you know, you can get an improvement of the result. But there are complex tasks. So then we have, they have introduced things such as COT, chain of thoughts. So what happens in chain of thoughts is you try to break it down. You have a complex query. So this is actually used to solve mathematical 
problems sometimes. And then you reason, and at the end, you come to the final answer. Then there is extensions to COT called TOT, tree of thoughts, right? So this is a very interesting area, I think, you know, which is growing really fast. Let's take a look at one called React. Has anyone heard of React? You have. Only one person? Right. Okay, so the React is recent and act. Right? So this is specifically important because this has a connection to tools. I'll talk about that in a minute. So LLMs or generative AI inherently don't perform actions, right? They generate stuff or they suggest things, right? Go to chat GPT, it will give me an answer. So the React has a, con a concept of React agents. So these agents, with the hel help of large language models, can perform actions. So this is called the tools. So these actions involve calling different tools. So these tools can be functions, they can be APIs, API resources, and so on. OK, so what, what does this mean? So let's take a look at this use case. Uh, so we are doing a similar thing in our products also, but this is not our product. This is just an example. So we have this train booking system that has three APIs, train API, email API, and payment API. And then you have this train booking service. So this is where the React agent is running. Right. So you feed the specification. So this is why the specifications are the key for these sort of systems. Specification describes how to interact with these APIs. So you feed the three open API specifications because this is REST. If it's GraphQL, of course, it's a GraphQL thing, right? Then you ask the question in natural language. So this is not a doc bot or anything. This is an action bot because it's actually performing tasks, right? So what happens is when you give that, then the, you know, this React agent will ask, OK, these are the specifications I have. Given this natural language query, you, you ask it from the LLM, what is the API that I should call? Then it figures out, OK, I should go and call this API. So LLM helps to you know, decide the API, and it also you know, generate that message. Because it knows the message, because you send the specification to the LLM. Right. So you can ask, for example, book me the next train to Gaul and send me an email confirmation. So you don't have to build a UI to do this anymore. You can just talk to it. So this is actually a very simple example. So think about the power of this when you have a lot of APIs. So what we are going towards is some kind of a universal application, right? OK, accuracy. So any ML. AI system, we need to evaluate the accuracy, right? Uh, accuracy is, you know, the core part of it, uh, which applies to generative AI as well. So you start with the data set, right? You have to have a metric. So as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you may have to invent your own metric. If it's a classification or regression problem, there are well-defined metrics that are there. But in this case, that might not be clear. So then you have to create your own metric. Now, one important thing is have this automated, right? Now, when you change your AI system, then you'll have to evaluate it and make sure that there's no drop in the accuracy before you push your code to production, right? So what we have noticed was even the slightest change in the prompt can result in a significant drop in the accuracy. So if some developer goes and change a prompt and then he pushes without you know, testing it out, then the whole thing can break. OK. So the data set is your 
on data set, right? But whether that the users will experience the same level of accuracy, we don't know. So that is why it's important to get the users' uh, feedback also. So this can be tricky because uh, you may require consent, right, to get this. But where possible, collect, uh, collect the feedback. And once we have that feedback, of course, you may have to go and do the cleaning process. And then what you do is you can update your vector databases or find in your models, improve your prompts, right? OK, performance. So the performance here is I'm talking about the speed, right? So as I pointed out earlier, in generative applications, most of the time, the model uh, becomes the, the bottleneck, right? And when you have complex reasoning, for example, React, uh, now this is just calling one API, right? You can see how many LLM calls are going. So you give the natural language, thing comes to the agent, agent will send an, you know, message to the LLM, it will reason, then it will, you know, call the API, and then it has to do another round of things to make sure that that is the final thing, right? So when you have this kind of a thing, <laughs> you can imagine, right? So what's happening to the latency? Can be pretty bad. So how do you deal with this? Of course, there is concepts such as caching. So these are actually already part of the, the libraries. Python has you know, these sort of things. So you don't always do a call to the LLM. You use, you look at the previous result and you return the cached result, right? So at some point in time, of course, the cache will get, you know, invalidated. So that way you can get some uh, performance uh, improvements, right? Uh, but that doesn't solve the problem uh, completely. So then what you can do is there are certain things when you build these generative AI kind of applications that you try to handle it at the, the front end, which we have done like uh, quite a bit. So what that means is can you send, for example, so now you get the query from the user, right? Of course, it has to go. So this is, again, the React. I'm focusing on React because that's very interesting. You do the LLM call. Then you do the API call, right? You haven't got the final result yet, but you can push something back to the client. So this is kind of like showing some partial state, right? So if you have WebSocket implementation, you can it is bidirectional, so the client doesn't have to do anything. The, this agent can push some results back to the, the client, and then it displays. Then you have the final call, right? OK, so what this means is the user has actually now seen two uh, results. So that actually has an impact as opposed to sending the, the final request. OK, so this brings us to the you know, uh, end of this talk. So with Gen AI development, you'll have to start with purposeful beginnings. So Srinath pointed out, you'll have to understand what is the value that it creates, and what is the problem that you are trying to solve. Right? So without having that understanding, you shouldn't start. Then I pointed out the importance of uh, you know, UI and UX. You need to start thinking deeply about this and you know, get your designs and get the feedbacks. Right? Don't wait till the last minute. Then we have you know, looked at all the technical stuff, selecting the models, uh, how do you improve the models. You might be building a rag. Uh, you know, it might be fine tuning and so on, but here it, it really comes down to the the use case, right? Uh, 
Then uh, we have uh, we have talked about APIs, importance of APIs, and AI API interaction, right? And the kind of experience that you can create when AI interacts with the APIs, and therefore having a APIs with well documented uh, well documented APIs will really help in here. Prompt engineering is you know, booming, and a lot of people are focusing on this, right? It's, and actually even there are job roles coming up, right? Accuracy, of course, we don't have to tell, it plays an important role. We have to continuously evaluate the accuracy, have the data set, and also update the data set, right? Users' feedback, you have to incorporate. Then we looked at the scalability and performance, and how to deal with the performance issues, right? How do you, how do you improve the user experience to the, you know, for the users who are using the Gen AI uh, application? So this is actually a, you know, very fast moving field. So different organizations are in different phases. Some organizations have started, some have preview features, you know, some have done really well. The important thing is that you have to start somewhere because it really depends on what you want to build and you understand your value. And as we go alone, the new models will come, right? And the speed will improve. Uh, and you know what's, what we call this, the prompt sizes will improve. Uh, new prompting techniques will come and so on. That's it. Thank you very much.